So do you agree if uh, you go in Uschlag as a quarter Gael? I'll give some opening comments as Gaelga, but I'll translate it after each sentence, just in case I lose you, because it's otherwise a very long paragraph. Okay. Anish Chakta Narig Ton Mosterula, Lovreha, Akadav Og Naheran. It's springtime, and we now have a bit of history in the first birthday of the Young Irish Academy. Toshi Salergrev and Quid Ibrid have here on Glushtok Ian Tokshaw, Kokorgus Lo Shud. It's very clear that there was a lot of work done behind this important development, and congratulations to all concerned. Quirm Fear, Keen Falcher Rivna Scalori Ilig at Tahod, Konakave e Ganesh, or Anglushok in Sparadok. I want to especially welcome all of the bright and enthusiastic scholars, uh, that's you by the way, um, who have been selected to pursue the inspiring work involved. Is Murna Buntashi Ta Aunanish, a Gumparad Leshna Hanisha, August of our son, Bimedic Fehev Latarid and Ainsko, August Tusak Mat Ledna Hibra. You will enjoy advantages that previous generations could only dream of. As a result, we will be expecting exception results, no pressure, and you're now off to a good start. And then to finish off with an old Irish saying, Molinoya Agus Chokig Sheed, praise the youth and they will flourish. So congratulations, young Academy members. It's a great privilege for me to formally welcome the new Academy members to the Royal Irish Academy this morning. Indeed, launching the Young Academy Ireland is an historic day for the Royal Irish Academy, and as such, it's important to reflect on how and why we wanted to establish the Young Academy Ireland. A number of years ago, the Academy identified the need to create an all-island interdisciplinary Young Academy and made it a key priority in its last strategic plan. Suffice to say that a lot of our Royal Irish Academy members have gotten a lot older discussing this initiative. In 2021, the Royal Irish Academy established a working group to progress this initiative. We launched the Early Career Research Survey, inviting the input of early career researchers on the mission, objectives and structures of a young academy. We asked a number of important questions in that survey and received almost 500 responses, of which 97% said that they would like to see a young academy established on the island of Ireland. And that is just part of the story of why we're here today, not just because we saw a need, but we wanted to create a forum for a more substantial and important voice for early career researchers on policy discussions and on areas that mattered to them. Before we opened membership for the Young Academy last year, no institutionalised approach to supporting early career researchers and innovators informed but by the principles of inter- and transdisciplinary discourse and based on equality, diversity, diversity and inclusion existed on the island of Ireland. We hope that this new academy will go some way to address this disparity and will give new impetus to the ideas, projects and creativity of the Young Academy members here today. All 40 of you, I hope. Supporting the next generation of academics and researchers, the leaders of tomorrow, is a core commitment of the Royal Irish Academy. It is important that scholars, researchers and professionals who are at an early stage of their career path are, not, are given not just a voice but a unique platform in which to exercise that voice. When we officially opened the membership process, we became the 51st Young Academy to be established worldwide, in line with international trends of national Young Academies in recent years. Being part of an international club has many rewarding aspects and opportunities and scope for several, several collaborative projects and initiatives, not just within Ireland, but internationally. However, more important than being a member of that club is the fact that we want this new academy to represent the present and the future about what is best on the island of Ireland. We hope to encourage members to assume more responsibility by fostering dialogue on education in the sciences and the arts, humanities and social sciences on research and policy discussions between stakeholders in society, the political sphere and academia. We hope that they will read, reach a wide audience by promoting inter- and transdisciplinary collaboration in areas where different disciplines of academic research intersect. Each of you has taken different career paths and roads to be here today. As in all walks of life, many of you have faced challenges and some setbacks, perhaps, along that path. The 25th anniversary of the signing of the Good Friday Agreement reminded us that nothing in life is worth doing, nothing in life worth doing is easy, even saying that sentence. There were no guarantees of peace, there were no guarantees that the agreement would work or indeed last, and yet it took remarkable vision and bold steps and individuals who were willing to rise to the challenge which ultimately changed the course of our nation's history. 
Each of you brings different strengths to the Young Academy. We know that you will work collaboratively, using your skills and experiences to benefit society and to find solutions to the many pressing national and global challenges. Some of those challenges at first glance seem overwhelming and never ending, from the green transition and climate change to the critical needs of housing, health and education, to name just a few. Every generation has their moment, their role in creating a better future and a more equal society. This is your moment. I wish you all for today a day filled with hope and excitement for what is to come, and I wish future success for the Young Academy Ireland. Thank you very much. So good morning to everybody. Um, I've met some of you already. I'm delighted to welcome you here to the Royal Irish Academy and to the Young uh, Academy of Ireland. So um, as the president has already spoken about the possibilities that the Young Academy members um, have and the opportunities to take on and address societal challenges, we look forward to supporting each and every one of you in that really important endeavour. The Academy will provide you with an opportunity to work with peers across disciplines on issues of shared interest and concern, engaging in policy and academic debates, creating an environment where you can strengthen your talent, your skills, leadership potential, and develop your professional networks. And that starts here this morning. I'm so delighted so many of you could join us for this. We know that a strong relationship with members of the Royal Irish Academy and Young Academy members will be important, and we're really committed to fostering those vital relationships, but also recognising your independence and your unique voice. The Royal Irish Academy will be a conduit for the Young Academy Ireland, helping to facilitate this work, giving you access to a wide range of perspectives and activities, including but not limited to things like training initiatives, mentorships and outreach, the creation of workshops, seminars and conferences, which I think we here in the Royal Irish Academy do so well. And of course, working with you on your flagship initiatives, which you as a group will have to decide upon. The Royal Irish Academy, with the support from Accenture, will sustain and promote Young Academy members. I want to congratulate each and every one of you here this morning on making it through a really very competitive process and being selected as Young Academy Ireland members. You represent early career researchers and innovators all over the island, and as such, that places a particular responsibility on your shoulders. This group represents the full breadth of disciplines in the sciences and humanities, and each of you have demonstrated excellence in your field of scholarship. Harnessing that excellence and working collaboratively as a multidisciplinary group who can draw on diverse insights provides you with a really exciting platform to articulate your concerns, opinions and ideas at the interface of science and society. And I should stress that when I use the word science, I mean it in its broadest possible terms. So the ancient Greek word episteme or the German word Wissenschaft, which really is that idea of embracing knowledge and scholarship. And I think you as a group epitomize that today. Young academies across the world have varied agendas and priorities, but all have important interests in common. They work to support early and mid-career researchers, promote science, education and research to a broad audience, engage in debates that matter and foster international and interdisciplinary collaboration. And I'm sure that the Young Academy Ireland will do likewise. We have a packed day for you today. Uh, you'll be hearing from the global Young Academy representatives, learning from other Young Academies around Europe and their experience of being a Young Academy member, I'm sure they'll be sharing with you the do's and the don'ts, so that will be interesting to hear. Um, you'll also be hearing from your fellow members, and I think that's really important. This is an opportunity for you as a group to meet each other today. Some of you may know each other. Others, it'll be your first time meeting. It's a really exceptional group, 
Um, and as I say, you're drawn from across all of the disciplines, so you'll have much to learn from each other. And I would really urge you today to introduce yourselves, have a chat. Today is the day to celebrate your achievement, but also to find out what each other's interests are. Um, and Roisin will be explaining later about um, next steps, and I suppose the hard work starts thereafter in deciding what you as a group want to prioritise. First, we have the, um, so later on in the afternoon then, we'll be learning how early career researchers and innovators can impact policy. Uh, um, and we have, uh, we're delighted to have policymakers here with us to explain what they need and require of a group uh, like yours. And, and for you, that's important to understand how you can then articulate your concerns and that, that it has a possibility of landing with policymakers. And really, that's a unique opportunity to shape the kind of society you want to live in. But first, we have the honour of having a very distinguished guest with us this morning, and I'm really delighted to be able to, um, uh, to welcome Anna Davis, who is Professor of Geography, Environment and Society at Trinity College Dublin. And the reason we're so delighted to have Anna is because, of course, she has made a significant impact in respect of policy and shaping the kind of society I think we all do want to see. And I think that's why her insights will be particularly um, important for this group today. Um, Anna is, uh, as I say, a, a Professor of Geography, Environment and so uh, Society at Trinity College Dublin, where she leads an environmental governance research group. She's a founding member of Future Earth's Knowledge Action Network on systems of sustainable consumption and production and Future Earth Ireland. Anna examines whose voices, values and visions count when shaping policy and practice. I think that's such a fascinating and important field of study. And I think particularly important for you as a group here today. She's a member of the Royal Irish Academy, so we're delighted to, to welcome one of our own members, um, and a fellow of the International Science Council, and currently chairs the Rediscovery Centre in Dublin, Ireland's national centre for the circular economy. So with that, I want to congratulate you all once again, looking forward to getting to know you, and um, to supporting you. We're delighted to have you here today, and I would like to welcome now um, Anna to the stage. Thank you so much. Congratulations again, and just to reiterate uh, the words of the President of the Royal Irish Academy and the, the Director here at the Academy. It's a great honour um, to be here today to talk to you a little bit about some of my experiences in a similar vein to, to your experiences that you're going to have over the next four years. I'm delighted to see the range of expertise that we have in the room and in the cohort of the Young Irish Academy. I'm also happy to see that this cohort includes not just researchers, academics, scientists, innovators, clinicians and professionals from across the island of Ireland. You already have made an impact in your disciplines and beyond, and I'm seeing, keen to see what your coming together will achieve. I was heartened to see that the goal for the Academy is to make a significant contribution to society by addressing many pressing national and global challenges and to work collaboratively for the benefit of society. There's certainly much work to be done in this regard and you will be get busy, I'm sure, over the next four years. So I thought it would be useful here today to talk about one of my experiences of working collaboratively in an interdisciplinary setting of scholars brought together by UNESCO. In this initiative, we were tasked for considering the role of higher education in achieving the sustainable development goals. In this initiative, we saw that the, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development ad adopted by the UN member states in 2015 provides a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people and the planet now and into the future. In October 2020, UNESCO partnered with the University of Bergen to establish the Global Independent Expert Group on Higher Education and the 2030 Agenda, which is EGU 2030 for short. The group consisted of 14 experts from a range of nations, as shown on this slide. Our work started from the undisputed position that the world is facing unprecedented challenges 
And that the complexity of these global challenges means that we need new agendas, new alliances, new incentives to address them. Within this context, higher education institutions have a specific responsibility and also unique opportunities to take action. This action includes not only practices within universities, but also beyond, engaging wider society for a sustainable future. Using virtual meeting technology, we were able to come together many times over the 12 month period. Our group included active researchers, as well as people with experience in policy work and diplomacy. The collective expertise spanned a range of disciplines from medicine and biology to philosophy and history. While today I'm gonna to be talking mainly about what we produced, it's also important to recognize the effect of such collaborations beyond a narrow focus of the report. I certainly learned a huge amount from the realities of working in higher education around the globe and huge, definitely, hugely different experiences of COVID that we were experiencing at the time. Sharing experiences was a key part of developing relations of trust between us all. It's important to recognize the very human nature of collaboration. The EGU 2030 group included people at very different life stages with a wide array of responsibilities beyond the work that we were brought together to create. Addressing the challenge of sustainability in the COVID pandemic, we laughed, cried, debated together as children, grandchildren, dogs and cats enriched our Zoom calls. While my, many higher education institutions are already contributing positively towards sustainable development, much deeper and far-reaching transformation is essential. It's not enough to simply recognize in a kind of aspirational way the paramount role that higher education institutions can play in relation to this agenda. Rather, it's essential to look at what really stands in the way for these institutions to help create a fairer, more humane, democratic, inclusive, and peaceful future for all. Our remit was given to us by the UNESCO in the form of four key questions shown on this slide. How can higher education gear up their activities to tackle global challenges? What new knowledge, research, and education strategies are needed? What are the necessary transformations required? And what can higher education do to ensure a more inclusive and sustainable future for all? After much brainstorming and discussion, three interrelated themes emerged to crystallize our thoughts. Disciplinarity, knowing, and higher education's role in society. And I want to outline these three now briefly, but do check out the report if you're interested to find out more details and many more case studies that we brought together. So the first was beyond disciplinary boundaries. We collectively recognize that unsustainability is a key example of a wicked problem on which multiple disciplines must converge if we are to both understand and try to transition to a more sustainable footing. It's not a criticism of the fundamental role that disciplines have and continue to play in the process of knowledge production. And we do also recognize that collaboration does already take place in certain spaces. However, we argued that the collaboration happens most when approaches and methods align, say within certain STEM disciplines, but it's less common across more radical interdisciplinary arrays including humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. Radical interdisciplinarity in research is not easy. And there are unequal patterns of power and privilege between and beyond disciplines. Prejudice and misconceptions among researchers and policymakers can work against more radical collaboration. Importantly, language matters. In 2019, the European Federation of Academies of Science and Humanities found that a technocratic and instrumental framing in the societal challenges funding call of Horizon 2020 had discouraged greater involvement of arts, humanities, and social science researchers. We certainly need to go beyond a problem-solving approach to achieving the sustainable development goals to incorporate critical, even transgressive, approaches in order to transition to more sustainable futures. 
Additional time, resources and investment will be required, as well as a cultural change in mindsets in academia and beyond, and an open dialogue between participants. New forms of training and more agile structures in higher education institutions will need to be developed and academics must have time to develop common understanding across disciplines. Two examples, sorry, just before, two examples of the going beyond disciplinary boundaries that are order, already taking place were brought to our attention by the group. And these are where transdisciplinarity have been really baked into the structures of institutions. So the Federal University of ABC in Brazil was set up in 2006. And as a new university, it was able to create structures from foundations up, free from past traditions. There are no departments, and the university explicitly seeks to foster interaction between academic members from different backgrounds. The reasoning given is that interdisciplinarity contributes to excellence, which in turn is seen as a condition for social inclusion. Closer to home, Utrecht University has created spaces for integrative research, living laboratories acting as safe spaces for meeting of minds within and beyond the university around sustainability. More than 1,200 academics are brought together within the pathways to sustainability strategic theme. Part of this interdisciplinarity, of course, embraces new ways of learning, new ways of knowing, new ways of conducting and creating knowledge. Diverse cultures possess different stores of knowledge, perspectives and language through which expressing understanding takes place. Even within cultures, there are diverse views of the nature of reality and how we might apprehend it. We felt that higher education, where it's not being inclusive of diverse knowledge systems, is leaving valuable knowledge to the cutting room floor, leading to less rigorous and sustainable outcomes. Mainstream academic knowledge has many merits, but should not assert an exclusive claim or relegate other ways of knowing to irrelevance or merely the exotic. This does not mean that anything goes. Greater degrees of humility, pluralism and understanding of context does not amount to relinquishing the capacity to distinguish truth and error. Rather, diverse ways of knowing offer intrinsic and instrumental value, as well as potential for restorative justice. Indeed, we felt that the SDGs themselves could also benefit in their future development from stronger dialogue with other ways of knowing. So how to do this? A prerequisite is widening participation, and language and action are key to decentering colonial forms of knowledge production and moving towards open science. Leadership is required from higher education heads to argue for more interventions that will promote a sustainable, inclusive and equitable research and education ecosystem. The good news is that despite uh, entrenched norms, a trend towards the support of more collaborative, transdisciplinary, globally relevant research is already taking place. A couple of examples around including different ways of knowing are included in our report. The first is the Cauca Intercultural University in Colombia, created in 2003 by the Regional Indigenous Council of the region, which is home to a quarter of a million people belonging to nine different indigenous groups. The university is part of their education system, our own education, as they call it, and a way towards a life in dignity, which is how the indigenous communities have defined their vision of the future. Elsewhere, universities begin to come to terms with their histories and legacies. For example, the University of Victoria in Canada committed itself to developing an indigenous plan, a strategic plan based on indigenous knowledge principles, which confronts and challenges colonizing practices that have influenced the past and which still are present today. The plan was launched in 2017 as a living document, a founding framework that is just the starting point in conversations and innovations. Our third theme addresses the need for a more proactive presence of higher education institutions in society across public, private and civil society spheres to promote sustainability. These interactions include and should go beyond research dissemination into policy design, social experimentation, advocacy, application of innovation and technological transfer. 
This should be a two-way flow of interaction. For this to work, higher education leaders need to pay heed to the incentives that currently promote a publish or perish trajectory, rather than encouraging academics to meaningfully engage with other sectors in pursuit of sustainability. There are different ways to do this. A good example is the new Act on Higher Education in Norway, which explicitly includes as one of its four aims that universities should contribute to sustainability. Universities might also consider making a signed commitment to contributing towards the SDGs, although action must follow any such commitment. This does not mean that higher education institutions should move away from basic research and classical education, but rather orienting the applied side of research away from purely economic return and towards the sustainable development goals. This means cutting activities that run counter to the sustainable development goals while stimulating activities that promote them. The Institute for Policy Research and Engagement at the University of Oregon in the United States uses a reflexive model for community science. Faculty and students partner with governments and NGOs as well as local community groups to identify and conduct research projects. Research begins with the notion of research as a public good that serves a social function. The projects are then driven by a messy process of social engagement. In the report, you'll see a suite of recommendations, some general, some specific relation to teaching, research and community outreach. Outreach, And the final section of the report sets these out. I'm not going to go through all of them now, but I want to flag some of the general recommendations. We argue that higher education institutions should have values and ethical principles, and that these should be made explicit, and higher education institutions should be held accountable for their activities and the values and principles they espouse. Critical thinking is one of the main values of higher education institutions. They must maintain a critical outlook and constantly reflect on their mission and role within society. Sustainability, we argue, should gradually become a core principle of higher education institutions, embracing structural and cultural changes that place sustainable development goals at the core of governance and management. Inter- and transdisciplinary activities in education and research that cut across traditional disciplinary-based structures of higher education institutions are needed. This is needed in order to face the complex problems the world faces today. These must be fostered and structural barriers removed. Incumbent forms of power and privilege that run counter to the SDGs must be challenged. Students should have the opportunity to participate in research projects that contribute to the fulfillment of the 2030 Agenda. We also argue that higher education institutions should be more open to dialogue and engagement with diverse communities who have developed other ways of knowing, and around sustainability in particular. Opening up to diversity must occur within as well as between cultures. Diverse forms of knowledge and ways of knowing must be embraced for the attainment of the SDGs, and partnerships beyond the academy will be key to this. These should be substantively strengthened, we argue, and oriented towards helping society navigate to a sustainable future for humankind and the entire biosphere. Finally, higher education authority institutions have a strong role to play in democratizing scientific knowledge and in creating awareness in all sectors of society. We need to know the reasons behind the urgent need to radically transform how we relate to nature and how we produce and consume. So to conclude, higher education institutions are uniquely positioned to contribute to the social, economic and environmental transformations that are required to tackle the world's most pressing issues. We argue that this can be initiated through three key developments, through greater inter and interdisciplinary work, more open institutions and stronger presence in society. This task will not be easy. There are systemic barriers that have inhibited transformations in these areas. The global higher education community must come together and share experiences and innovations if we are to make significant progress. Higher education leaders and actors must push for transformation within their institutions. 
Our aim in the expert group was not to dictate solutions, but rather to open up areas for debate and discussion to guide decision making. Regardless of the different perspectives and reactions to the report, we hope that it will be used as a tool to engage in critical discussions. The Sustainable Development Goals will expire in 2030, and higher education institutions must look ahead, not only to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals now, but also to being intensively involved in crafting the next steps and the goals beyond 2030. Finally, I'd like to wish you all the best in developing and implementing your collective actions over the next four years. I hope we can count on you to encourage and support actions for global sustainability. It's a wicked problem and one that's very diverse. Clearly, the institutional landscape globally is incredibly differentiated in terms of the experiences that people face on the ground, very, very different challenges. I think, Luke, the, the kind of DORA principles are trying to make some headway in terms of opening up different ways of valuing the work and knowledge that's created. But I agree that the, the, it is difficult to push against a trend towards this more formalized assessment. I think we're, we're relatively lucky here in Ireland that we haven't followed the pathways that some of our nearest neighbors have for, for many years, although they are also revisiting the investment in time that's required from an administrative perspective that goes into these kind of formal assessment processes. I mean, I would like to think that with the emergence of different ways of accounting, things like donut economics in terms of the policy sphere, opens up discussions for the ways that we can create value, which isn't always quantifiable, and recognizing the value of more qualitative impacts uh, that, we, that we create through our work, particularly through these collaborative processes. Certainly, in my experience, we were greater as a group of 14 experts than we were of our individual parts. And I think that you know, that's what's very difficult for individualized assessments to capture, when increasingly the work that we do is collaboratively based interdisciplinary in many situations. How do you pass the, the contributions that individuals make and assess them as individuals when our endeavors are often collaborative? So I think it's, it's an intractable case, but I'm hopeful that I'm not seeing any articulation in the Irish context, at least, of moving towards this very quantifiable system. But if anybody of you, any of you have any questions around you know, what it's like to bring people together, how do you structure and decide on ideas? These are things that you, know, you will be working through today, I'm sure, but I'll be very happy to give some of my experiences, both with the International Science Council, with the EGU 2030 group, um, through things such as the Future Earth and Future Earth Island here at the Academy. Um, so if you have any questions related to that, I'm happy to take them now or over coffee later, whatever suits. I'm not sure what the timing is. No, it's not, it's not easy and it requires an openness on both sides to recognize the limitations and assumptions that go behind those decisions methodologically, but also epistemologically, where your starting point is. And this is what takes so much time and which doesn't necessarily fit into the kind of assessment cycles that we might also be subject to, particularly as early career researchers who may or may not have a permanent position or may or may not be in a tenure track process. You know, investing time to get those conversations started at that very foundational level is pretty scary when you're on a time scale for delivering X number of papers or grant income by a certain period. And this is where we're arguing for the support of institutions to promote that. But I think what you're saying is kind of more fundamental even that is about how do we have conversations across different ways of, of, of seeing the world, this ways of knowing. Um, and, and, and it can't happen if we all retrench back to our kind of first principles. And we have to be open to understand the scientific, the sort of history and social processes that embed all of our scientific processes. Even if you have, say, the scientific method as one approach, 
that the way that that is then applied in particular context and the way that questions are formed uh, will have a, a different impact in terms of how we then proceed in collaborative settings. So just being open, I think, to reflecting on our own assumptions and our own biases through our training will be important. And one of the points that we make in the report is that this kind of training for the openness in terms of the way of thinking has to start at undergraduate level, if not before. I mean, it's great to, to hear that your daughter was thinking through these things in relation to such an early stage. But I think, you know, if we ensure that the message is got across from the very point of higher education, uh, education starting, then at least we have a better chance of being able to have those conversations, but it won't be easy. We absolutely have to. Um, and I think and I hope that we're moving a corner in Ireland, particularly around how this focus on particularly from SFI, or you're referring to there, um, that kind of jobs and growth strategy, I think, has softened. Um, it's still going to be there for sure in the future. But I think that, that there, are, there, there is light at the end of the tunnel, I think, around that. I think the, the challenge is again goes back to the point I was just making about ensuring that undergraduate education exposes everybody to these kinds of broader value systems because many of our politicians, many of the policy makers have been to university. They may not have done research in a kind of postgraduate setting, but they will have had an undergraduate education. So really ensuring that that message comes in at undergraduate period is, is vital. And then we all have a collective responsibility to make sure that we articulate the value beyond economic value um, and the investment rather than the costs of doing things differently for the long term. So I think groups like the Young Academy, like the Royal Irish Academy, have a pivotal place in the ecosystem to try and make the case strongly in, in ways that uh, the public can get on board with because we need that support. Uh, we need to ensure that people just don't think that as academics, we sit around twiddling our thumbs for three months in the summer, which is still the kind of perpetuated narrative that we see in popular media on occasion, or that we focus on esoteric things that have no application. So the communication of what we do is vitally important. But also I'm a little bit, um, reticent to say that we as academics must do everything, that we must be the communicator, the disseminator, the exploiter, the researcher, the teacher, you know, these things, you know, we have different skills and skill sets between us, but I can guarantee in this cohort in the room, there will be people that have those, all of those skills. So that's the value of coming together where people can really pursue the things, the strengths that they have and bring those to the conversations that you have. So I think that, it is going to be difficult and, and increasingly, not just um, sort of, it's say, in an Irish context, but globally. You know, in, in certain settings in the global south, for example, you know, the, the pressures on education, the finance for education is extremely limited. And I think there's a lot to be done here in terms of north-south partnerships, not in terms of a brain drain, but in terms of actually empowering uh, institutions on the ground in those contexts. But money talks at the end of the day. You know, we, we need to, to ensure that we get resources in whatever shape or form that, that comes in, which enable us to do the work that's vitally important and communicating the message will be key. So multi-pronged <laughs> attack for sure is gonna be required here. So it's, we need to do things in a kind of aligned fashion, I think. And certainly in my experience where most traction has been created is when you have almost like a campaign, if you like, around a particular piece of work. And you can, the IPCC, for example, did, did, did great work around that in the most recent synthesis report. I think it had a lot of impact. And that impact due to changes which have occurred in media coverage of these issues over the last 10 years has been dramatic. I mean, the, the fact and the, the volume of uh, articles, say, in the Irish Times around the environment and climate change has dramatically, almost exponentially increased over time. 
So I think we need to do things at the same time. Strategically pinpointing individuals who are key decision makers is crucial, but we can't expect a trickle down process to work in the absence of the ground grassroots kind of push. Uh, and the combination of forces from the top, bottom and the sides is going to be required. So I wouldn't prioritize one over the other, but I think that you need to consider multiple avenues to create a, a, a point of dialogue. And, and we hope that in this case that I talked about today that the report was that. We knew that the report would, would upset some people. We knew that the report would potentially um, pit different groups and positions and disciplines against each other. Um, but what we were hoping was that through conversations about some of the tricky issues, the devil in the detail that, that Luke mentioned, that at least those conversations were being held. And, and that isn't better than, than not being discussed at all. So we'll take our small wins when we get them.